Hello, I believe I'm live. So it's very nice to meet everyone. Uh, my name is Mark Miano. I'm our VP of sales here at Glue, and I'm very excited to present to everyone on the call today. I believe that we have over 100 attendees, which is very exciting. Um, but today the topic is going to be diamond metrics. In terms of the feedback that we've gotten over the past few years as a company is that there's a lot of metrics inside glue.io, which is a really big understatement. Um, and really people wanna know where to begin, right? It's where do I start? What's unique about glue, things of that nature. So what we've done is we've, as a company, pulled together insights uh, or what we call diamond metrics uh, to help you take full advantage of both the platform as well as to bring your companies to the next level of profitability. A Couple of things about these is there's a lot of these diamond metrics, so we will hold more than one of these webinars, but today we're gonna go ahead and get started with uh, what I think are, are the ones to, um, to begin with to lay down a strong foundation of understanding how to bring your business to the next level. Excellent. Um, screen share. The agenda today is gonna be as follows. We're first going to go through the two goals um, we need to have some goals before we start actually talking about metrics. We're then going to cover lifetime value, trending lifetime value, customer segmentation, and customer CLTV. We're then going to cover customer attribution, or excuse me, um, attribution in general. And then we're going to have a Q&A at the very end. Um, I will go obviously go into all of these in detail. First of all, let's cover some goals, all right? Um, we are selling things online, goods and services online, so let's boil away everything to two specific goals. Goal number one is we want to acquire customers, but not just any customers, okay? We're gonna acquire the right customers. So what that means is we wanna acquire customers that have the highest potential lifetime value possible, or in other words, we want to acquire customers with the tastes that make the second, third, and fourth sale that we're going to obviously try to get them to get them to perform in a lot easier of a manner. For example, um, I work with a company that sells bikinis, all right? Um, I bought a bikini for my wife recently off of that website, but unfortunately I am not bikini.com's right customer, all right? Um, I don't wear bikinis, I know it's 2018, you wouldn't judge me if I did, but that second, third, and fourth purchase will never happen. So every time that bikini, that bikini company retargets me through Facebook or some other um, advertising platform, they're flushing their advertising dollars down the toilet. So we need to make sure that when we acquire customers, that we're acquiring customers with the tastes, that, make that second, third, and fourth sale that much easier. Think about giving a little bit of that conversion rate away in order to acquire more quality customers. The second goal is to upsell those customers, right? Now that we've done the hardest part, which is acquire the right customers, Going to meaningfully upsell those people in very strategic and cost effective and efficient ways. And I will go through this um, with you, not only in this webinar, but in other webinars to follow. The first piece here is going to be around lifetime value and firmly understanding what lifetime value is and how it's calculated. Okay. Um, and an economic standpoint, what lifetime value is, is the amount of money that someone's going to spend with you until one of two really bad things happen. Either they die or you go out of business, right? We hope none of those things happen, but eventually they do. But the idea is it's the amount of money that each one of your customers are actually worth. The way to calculate it is going to be the average order value of a person or set of persons multiplied by the average purchase frequency of that person or set of persons, right? So the idea is that if they buy more from you and or if they, they buy more often from you, your business will grow more efficiently. In the longest of terms, you're gonna find that you are either one or the other when it comes to a quote unquote type of company, right? Typically you'll lean more towards an average order value heavy type company, or you might lean towards more of an purchase frequency type company. So for example, um, food delivery, clothing, makeup, a lot of uh, what e-commerce is uh, comprised of is going to be more of a purchase frequency heavier type company, right? We're typically expecting more than about two purchases a year from our customer. 
The invert of that is maybe an average order value heavy type company. Maybe I'm selling high end stereo systems. And the expectation is that I don't have to come back, hopefully, more than once a decade to upgrade my stereo system, right? So every company is going to be a little bit different. But just note for this call, we're going to focus a little bit more on the a purchase frequency heavier type company. We're not going to ignore the average value heavier type company, but that purchase frequency heavier type company is probably what you're going to be able to relate to the most. Now, let's go ahead and jump into diamond metrics. The first one that we're going to want to tackle is going to be trending lifetime value. And everyone on this call, if you are a Glue, a glue customer, um, you already have this. And this is one of my favorite charts to start with first, which is going to be the lifetime value of your company on a rolling 12-month window. So the diamond metric here, guys, isn't lifetime value in and of itself in a vacuum. To be clear, it's actually the rate of change on your lifetime value over long periods of time. Now, if we keep average order value constant, like we said, we're going to focus a little bit more on the purchase frequency heavier type company. What I want to see is I want to see the slope of this curve moving from southwest down here in the bottom left-hand corner and a nice steady line moving up into the northeastern direction like you see here. I don't want to see big spikes. I don't want to see it go straight up. I don't want to see it go straight down. I just want to see that nice steady curve like you see here. The reason why we want to see that is because both of the goals that I just outlined for you in the beginning of this call are actually competing for the slope of this line, and both are necessary. The repeat purchase down here, all this blue, that's pushing the slope of the line up. Okay, So if I cut acquisition for any of your stores altogether, what you'll find is that your lifetime value would actually spike up dramatically and then crash due to diminishing marginal returns. So that means we need new customers, right? We need to pump fresh blood into the, your company so that we have more people to sell things to. The new order is very important. Before each of your new customers hits that button for the that buy button for the first time, what's going to happen is they're going to buy and, and that's going to put downward pressure on the slope of this line. Let me repeat that. When you acquire a new customer, they're starting with a lifetime value of zero. They haven't bought anything from you yet. So when you're acquiring new customers, maybe you think of Black Friday when a lot of people experience an injection of new customers, you're going to find that your lifetime value might even dip a little bit. Don't panic. That's actually a really good thing because you're now acquiring new customers to sell to. So if you are actually able to both acquire the right customer and upsell those people over long periods of time, you're going to find that a really healthy LTV curve for a purchase frequency heavier type company will look like the one that you see here. However, let's not ignore the average order value type company altogether. If you're just selling one product, what you might find is your lifetime value might just be a um, horizontal line moving across the screen. That's okay. The name of the game for you is going to be acquisition, acquisition, acquisition. It's expensive to do that. So maybe what you might want to do if you have only one product is to innovate and come up with new offerings and new products to upsell your uh, customer base with in order to create efficiencies and in order to grow your company as efficiently as possible. If you have any questions about this, I'm very excited to answer them, but we're going to move into the second or, or the second diamond metric, which is going to be customer segmentation and customer lifetime value. If you're looking at my screen, I'm moving over here into customers, all customers. And most people using Glue should be familiar with customer segmentation. If you aren't familiar with customer segmentation, and you're running an e-commerce store or any store, definitely you're going to want to uh, include this into your day-to-day. -day. Customer segmentation has two purposes. Purpose number one is through marketing and marketing automations. If anyone's using MailChimp or Klaviyo or, or doing any email campaigning, treating different people differently is not new to you, right? That's sure to boost conversion rates. So, for example, um, we've done a lot of work with the NFL. If you think of the NFL, they're unique in the aspect that they have to segment out their customer base by geographic region, right? If I come in here and I create a segment, we're down here in Charlotte, North Carolina, by the way, and I want to market to maybe North Carolina Panthers fans, what I might do is I might create a segment 
where people live in Charlotte for these group of people. And if I'm the, the Panthers, for example, or I'm the NFL, I'm going to market Panthers paraphernalia to people living in the North Carolina area. Now, side note, we have a great integration with MailChimp. Um, you might have an ESP that's doing this already. So let's actually jump into the diamond metrics here that apply to customer segmentation. What if I'm the NFL and I, like the hundreds of people on this call, have only 24 hours in the day? And I have to prioritize which different markets I'm going to concentrate on over others. I mean, for example, Philadelphia did just win the Super Bowl. That might or might not impact that specific market's uh, willingness to spend more money with me in the longest of terms. So when I'm creating my segments, I'm not just going to push these over to the ESP for marketing automation purposes. What I'm going to do is I'm going to go to customer segments and I'm going to rank my segments in order of lifetime value. The higher the lifetime value of that group of people or that segment of customers, the more curious I'm going to be about what characteristics these people share so I can go find more people like my highest paying customer base. In this particular example, it's my VIP customers, okay? An action point that we might wanna do is I might wanna export this CSV file and import it into something like Facebook lookalike audiences and allow Facebook to go find more people who share the characteristics of my highest paying customer base. For example, I work with a woman's pajamas company, okay? And they actually made an extra 10% quarter over quarter by doing this simply by trying to understand what characteristics their highest paying customers share. You'll also see that ESP push here, right, with MailChimp. So don't be afraid to go ahead and market to these people. In the case of a VIP customer here, or the top 10% of your customers by revenue, I should be able to tap any one of your VIP customers on the shoulder, on the street, and ask them, hey, are you so-and-so's VIP customer? And they should be able to look at me like I'm crazy and say, of course I'm so-and-so's VIP customer because they told me so. Their biggest lead generator, guys, is going to be word of mouth. It's not going to be digital marketing advertising. So it's really important that you leverage your highest paying customer base, not just trying to understand their characteristics, but mobilizing these people to go find you more leads and more people like them so you can sell to them. Another diamond metric worth mentioning is this really important metric here, which is telling you what percentage of your revenue is coming from specific segments of your client base. In this case, I'm looking, let's look, at the past year of data, and I see that 39.4% of my annual revenue is coming from 10% of my customer base. How profound. For example, I'll give you two examples of how this, this is important. Candle company, okay, it's a candle making company, and they saw that 80% of their annual revenue was coming from 10% of their customer base. That's alarming. What if one of these few customers that spent so much money with them left? It would knock a huge percentage of their annual revenue out from underneath them, opening, up to, opening, them, open, opening them up to um, maybe going out of business. On the inversion of that, I work with an air filter company, okay? 10% of their annual revenue was coming from 10% of their customer base. That's really bad. There was zero loyalty to that air filter company. Okay, They were just a commodity. What their action point was, was to develop some type of loyalty programs in order to make themselves stickier as a company so they weren't having to acquire new customers so often, which is very expensive. When I click here into products purchased, what we'll also cover in another webinar is going to be the tastes of your highest paying customer base. It's really important to maybe not just think about the margin of your product, which Glue calculates for you, but to understand the tastes of your highest paying customer base. Because once we know what products your highest paying customer base like to buy, what we can do is showcase those products maybe in the user experience on your website 
or maybe you promote them to your zero purchase customer base in order to give up a little bit of that conversion rate in order to attract customers that are willing to spend the big bucks with you in the long term so that your costs are low and your profits are high. So a very important page here when it comes to not just thinking about customer segmentation when it comes to business intelligence, uh, excuse me, when it comes to marketing automations only, it's really important that you segment out your customer base to understand how you're gonna go about marketing in the most intelligent and efficient of ways, which is attracting the highest paying customers. And then once attracted, making sure that those potentially high LTV customers see that LTV actually physically realized. Great. What we're now gonna move into is we're now gonna move into attribution modeling. Really important that we understand how to allocate ad spend effectively in order to attract the highest paying customers and also making sure those customers once acquired see that potential lifetime value realized. If you're unfamiliar with attribution modeling, what the definition of attribution modeling is, is the science or art of assigning sales credit to different touch points in the customer journey. It's really important that everyone knows that no attribution model on its own is perfect. In fact, in demonstration of that, of that very um, bold statement, Glue itself has multiple attribution models. Um, we are experts in this field, but for the purposes of keeping things simple today, we're gonna concentrate, in my opinion, what is the most practical attribution model. The first purchase attribution model. What a first purchase attribution model is, is it assigns sales credit for John Doe, all of John Doe's purchases. All that sales credit is going to be given to the channel that got John Doe to buy for the first time. Let me give you an example. November 2017, let's say John Doe comes in through AdWords for the first time in November 2017 and buys. Well, AdWords will be given credit for that purchase. However, let's fast forward to September 2018. What if John Doe came in a second time through Facebook in September 2018 and bought through Facebook in September 2018? Well, AdWords will still be given credit for that second purchase because AdWords was what got John Doe to buy for the first time. Now, this page that you're seeing here, revenue by channel and net profit by channel and overview, this is a powerful page, but this is the page that we look at after a certain sales interval, right? This is a, how did I do making decisions page? We don't make decisions off of this page, guys. We ask ourselves, how did I do making decisions leading up to me now looking at this chart? The metaphor that I use is a report card. When we're raising our children, we don't tell our children to study for a test by studying their report card, okay? They study, do their homework, ask questions in class, do all the things that go into getting a good grade. Same idea here. If you don't like what you see on this page, we're not gonna drop everything and then pour all of our money into AdWords because AdWords got us the most money last month. We're going to look at this page and reflect on if the decisions that we made actually were the right ones. In other words, channels don't buy things. People buy things. And because people buy things, not channels, what we're gonna do, you guessed it, is we're gonna actually come back to the lifetime value tab. And I'm gonna scroll down here to LTV-based customer profitability. And I'm gonna take a look at all your channels and I'm going to rank your channels in order of lifetime value. The higher the lifetime value of the channel, the more weight you're going to want to place into that strategy over the lower LTV strategies, right? So in other words, I have 781 people coming from email for the first time in the past year. These people will pay $228 each with me. I have 130 people coming from Facebook for the first time in the past year, and these people pay $100 less each with me. In a zero sum game, what I would do is pull my effort out of my lower LTV strategy and place that effort into my higher LTV strategy. When I do this, what would happen is my new customers will rise faster in my higher LTV strategy than my lower one. And we already acknowledge that 
new customers are starting from an LTV of zero when they buy for the first time, this will put natural pressure on the lifetime value of that higher strategy. And what you're gunning for is for this column right here by my mouse to be the same dollar amount. Because if you think about it, if this column right here is the same dollar amount, what that would mean is that regardless of what channel my customer is coming from, everyone is paying the same amount of money with me, which would mean I've completely optimized my advertising spend. Side note, that probably will never happen in real life, right? Otherwise, we could just go home and let the e-commerce store maintain itself, right? There's many other variables that work on our store, but it's really helpful to understand the data science behind this and how easy it is to allocate ad spend now that you have glue. I think it's also important to note, guys, that CAC and profit per new customer and, and return on ad spend, these are really important metrics, but for the purposes of simplicity and making sure that we keep focused on the two goals, I'm gonna now jump into um, the Facebook channel here, and we're now going to look at this data on a campaign level, because the reality is, is that the real action points are actually being derived at the campaign level. Now remember the two goals. Goal number one is we want to attract the highest paying customers, and goal number two is once those customers are captured, we wanna make sure that those customers see that potential lifetime value realized. Now that you have glue, for the campaigns that are making you money, you will now be able to understand how to use those campaigns more effectively than you were using them before. You already probably can tell revenue per campaign, but now what Glue can do is assign a lifetime value to that campaign as well so we can understand how to create efficiencies. For example, what if I had a campaign that had a high amount of revenue and that campaign had a high amount of lifetime value? Well, remember, we're using a first purchase attribution model. So what that most likely means is that that's a great acquisition campaign because it made me a lot of money and that lifetime value is high because that lifetime value is not just taking into account that first purchase, but that second, the third, the fourth, the fifth, all the purchases that got these people to buy for the first time are being credited to that original campaign that got them to be acquired. So let me explain that one more time. High revenue, high lifetime value. That's a great acquisition campaign because that lifetime value is capturing all the sales from um, the people that this campaign acquired, not just the revenue from that one campaign on its own. Let's do the inversion of that. What if I had a campaign that had a high amount of revenue and that campaign had a low lifetime value? High revenue, low lifetime value. What that would typically mean in the longest of terms is that's a great retention campaign. It's making me a lot of money, which can't be ignored, but the lifetime value is staying stubbornly low. What that most likely means is that the lifetime value credit for those people is going to the campaign that got them to convert for the first time. So the deduction is that this is not these first, these people's first purchase. This is a great upsell campaign. I'll give you an example. We work with a company that sells um, swim trunks and, and, and swimming clothes, okay? And we were looking at their data, uh, this was like only last week, and we saw this campaign that had high, high revenue and low lifetime value, and we said, hey, what kind of campaign is this? And they said, oh, that's our welcome email that we send to customers who bought for the first time. Oh, so people who bought from you for the first time, they're getting a welcome email asking them to buy again in a short time frame, and it seems to work. That's a great upsell campaign. Pretty cool. We live in an imperfect world though. So you will come in here and you might see some conflicting data. So let's take a third, let's take a third example. What if I had a campaign that had high revenue, high lifetime value, I just told you that was a great acquisition campaign. But what if that campaign had one new customer and like 500 repeat customers, right? Like high revenue, high lifetime value, which should be a good acquisition campaign, but one new customer and 500 repeat customers. You might be like, wait, what's going on here? 
I sat through that Glue webinar and they told me this was a great acquisition campaign. What's going on? Well, in that case, what might have happened is that one new customer must have spent so much money with you that that person single-handedly warped or skewed the LTV to be artificially high. The action point in that scenario would be to go into your segmentation and let's hunt that guy down or girl down. I'm going to say campaign is whatever campaign it might be. And maybe I reach out and say, hey, do you want a wholesale relationship with me? I mean, you did, you did single-handedly skew one of my uh, retention campaigns to be an acquisition campaign. Do you want a wholesale relationship with me? What's going on? Um, I work with a jewelry company, actually, who discovered that her styles were being ripped off in China, where someone from China actually bought one of each one of her styles and started replicating it and, and taking her intellectual property. So her action point was to stop selling to China to save herself a huge amount of liability there. But the point, guys, is this attribution model, if you can understand it, will be a great one-stop shop and the most practical to help you understand how to attract the highest paying customers and also what campaigns are great for making sure those customers are actually upsold to completion in the most efficient way possible. All right, great. So going to stop there and would love to field any questions if we have any, um, any specifics. So um, I would love to just take a pause here and, um, and take a look at some questions that might be um, populating or, or would love to stand by for a few minutes to let that happen. Questions. If you want to stop sharing your screen, oh. you aren't doing it while we wait for some questions. Oh. Close video. We have one from Stacy. Stacy, how can we access the recording? We'll definitely be in touch um, after this email. Yes, I, I a lot to digest. We'll definitely be in touch after this webinar with an email with clear directions uh, where you can share this recording as well as um, have it on file for yourself. Um, Abby, who is our marketing director, will be on top of that ASAP. We're going to stand by for about... Um, uh, three or four minutes here, um, so it's all it's all you guys. It's a lot to digest. So if you have any like specific, oh, so Ben had a question in that example of a welcome email following a first purchase. Is a CTA or other offer needed to make that valuable? You know that's a good question, Ben. Um, I think that off the top of my head, a call to action. might be a little bit premature. This is just my, this is just actually my um, own personal opinion. So what I mean by that is in another webinar, we will talk about lapse point. So what our lapse point does is it calculates the average distance between purchases to help you understand what the optimal upsell window would be for you and or your client. Um, if I may just, um, I'm going to share my screen again. We'll actually cover this, and this might be a good uh, segue. Maybe we'll cover it right now. So if I get future value, what you'll see on this page is customer status. So there's an active, at risk, or lost customer status. And this status is dictated by your, comp your client or your company's lapse point. So a lapse point is the average distance between the purchases, the repeat purchases that you or your client have had for all eternity. This is not an accident. So Whatever your lapse point is, is the actual average distance between any repeat purchase. From there, we place customers into an active at risk or lost status. And this status actually lives throughout all of Glue. You'll even see that status here. It's a segment. And if I click into the customer detail, we actually provide you, and I bet I'm answering your question head on, how to treat each, uh, each customer based on their status. Now, for a welcome email, they're going to be in that active status. They're less than 80% of the way through their lapse point. 
And what we want to do here is we want to build trust and nurture. So we, we don't want to necessarily ask the customer to buy again. I mean, they just bought from you, right? So the idea for like a swimwear company is we want to, we want to get them, hey, welcome to the store. We're so excited that you bought. Here's Kim Kardashian wearing it. Um, you know, we want, to, we want to build that and make it their idea, to, again, to buy in that active window. So I don't think, and I think then the call to action would be saved for when they're over 80% of the way through their lapse point. And that's when you've built that trust. They've gotten the product. They now trust you. Now we can push them hard with a call to action to make it, uh, to capitalize on, on that one. All right. Um, Ed Sharf had a question. How can we ensure the ROAS is reporting correctly? I'm seeing a lot of zeros, even though there's an LTV. Great question. So I'm going to share my screen again, as always. And then I'm going to jump right here into lifetime value. I'm going to slow down a little bit for the um, screen to catch up. So ROAS, right? We need to make sure we're paying attention to the date picker, first and foremost. I'm then going to scroll over here into ad spend. Right now, ROAS is going to be automatically calculated for Google AdWords, for Facebook paid, for Instagram, wherever that one is, and for Bing. Okay, I'll repeat that. Facebook, Instagram, AdWords, and Bing. And if I actually come in here into store settings, the way that we get that ad spend or extract that ad spend out of your account is through the direct integration when it comes to the advertising platform. Oh, I should add another one. Ad roll two will also pull in the ad spend automatically. Now from that moment, we're pulling in the ad spend, right? Directly out of the API. And that ad spend is gonna automatically change depending on what date range you're looking at. From there, what we're gonna do, if I hover my mouth, excuse me, mouse over ROAS, is we're gonna take the revenue pulled in by the respective channel in whatever date range we're looking at, and we're gonna divide that by the advertising spend like I just showed you. And that will be how we calculate ROAS. So if your ROAS is calculating zero, it either means that your revenue is zero or we're looking at a channel that we, haven't, we don't have an API with and you can go ahead and export the CSV file and then you know, run the ROAS metric yourself given that we've set you up for success uh, at that point. And obvious no revenue from some of these channels. So, oh, Ed, great question. So the revenue here is going to be, um, and by the way, um, the revenue won't be shown in the screen. I'm going to come back here to performance and overview. This will be the revenue um, that we're using uh, by my mouse here in order to calculate ROAS, okay? But remember, the revenue column is practicing a first purchase attribution model, all right? So what that means, and I hover over AdWords here, is in the past 365 days, I made $489,904 from people who bought from AdWords for the first time. Your type of ROAS calculation, right? Which is why I went into the campaign level to give you the insights you need uh, to both acquire and to upsell. Great questions, by the way. Very good. Oh, yeah. oh. oh question. So is it possible to change the attribution model, i.e. Oh. last click? From in, in glue.io, it is not possible to change the attribution model where you're where I'm showing it to you, but I will help you find where the two other attribution models are hiding, okay? We are in development for being able to switch uh, the views where I showed you, but let me at least show you where the other attribution models are hiding as of now, and we'll send out an update on how to do this um, yourself. Can you, can you see my screen? Yeah, Okay. So the last click attribution model is gonna be found in the orders tab. So the last click means that channel that 
got that specific order or the channel that was clicked before that specific order is going to be given credit for that sale. And you'll actually see this on an order level and you can export this CSV file and, and run with it, right? And visualize it how you want. So you'll see like this order, right? Uh, by Noah Moore at gmail.com on October 18th. He came in through AdWords for that one order. This could be Noah's second purchase, third purchase, fourth purchase, or whatever. But this specific order is going to give credit uh, to AdWords. So this is probably what a lot of people are most used to, as this is what Google Analytics practices. Okay. The third attribution model will be Facebook centric. So when you come over here into performance advertising, and you click. Facebook in the drop-down menu, Facebook has its very own attribution model. I am not going to claim to know exactly how to use it, as a lot of Facebook gurus do. I think it's like a three-day, three 28-click? Three 28 days, yeah. 28 days, yeah. 28 day, yeah. yeah. Um, I, I, don't, I really want to make sure that people know that I'm not an expert in the Facebook attribution model, but the Facebook attribution model is in and of itself living uh, and reflected in the performance advertising area. Do you have any more questions? We have another question from Mike Harney. What should we do to be ready for the big holidays coming up? What should we do getting ready for the big holidays coming up? What a great question. Oh, man. Okay. So um, I think the first thing that I would do getting ready for the holidays coming up is I would try to understand a couple of things. I would say the first thing I would try to understand is – Actually, I'll compartmentalize it into four things. I want to understand who I'm selling to, what I'm selling to them, where I'm selling to them, and when I'm selling to them. Okay, And I'm going to try to just hit on these lightly because I don't want to speak for another hour unless everyone wants to listen. But um, understanding who we're selling to will be very much revolved around segmentation. Okay, I think the first thing I'd suggest that you do is to find customers that bought from you last holiday season. Okay. Once a customer, always a customer. They bought from you last holiday season. They've already gone through the motions and received their product and experienced your service. That would probably be the best way for you to grow your business in the short term is to go find those people. And you can easily do this through um, the date picker and, and this menu right here. I think the second thing I would suggest that you do is think of what sold during the holiday season last year and then use that information in order to come out swinging with the products which are holiday friendly. You can do that by coming into products and in all products, carving out the holiday season right of last year or any other previous year, November to December. And then take a look at what products were most popular during this really specific time so that you know what to market and what not to market so you're using your resources wisely. I think the third thing that you might want to do in the holiday season is understand what channels last year or any previous holiday season performed the best for you. And that can be done by going into performance overview and by taking a look at, you know, November, oh, excuse me, November through December, look at the same date picker, right? And then clicking into your, um, your campaigns, like I showed you with the first purchase attribution model and taking a look at what campaigns got the most traction last year and which campaigns didn't. Now, I just covered who, what, and where. I mean, when is already answered for you. It's during the holiday season. Um, so I think that would be the tactic that I would use personally or suggest to my clients personally is take a look at who bought from you last year in the holiday season, what did they buy, and where did they buy it, and use those breadcrumbs in order to engineer uh, your strategy to acquire the highest paying customer and then to um, you know, upsell those people. We have another question from Danita, and she asks, so there could be duplication if more than one platform claims attribution i.e. if Facebook's attribution is X days and Google CPC is X days they could both be claiming the same order? That is a very important question, right? So um, that comment is very, very important when it comes to understanding attribution model 
attribution modeling at the highest level. So think of attribution modeling guys as like a test score, right? So if I were to compare a first purchase attribution model with Facebook at Facebook's attribution model, that wouldn't make any sense. You would get conflict like the question I just, I just received. What I'm trying to say is that that would like, that would be like comparing a GMAT score for a business exam with an SAT score to get into college. Both are numbers, but to compare both of those numbers, they're grading different tests, right? In different ways. It doesn't make any sense to compare those two numbers with one another. So it's a very valid question, right? If I come in here into Facebook advertising and I see that Facebook takes credit for an order and then I come back over into overview and I see that AdWords is taking credit for another order, that's just the nature of attribution modeling in general, but it will give you insight into how your advertising spend is being allocated in the longest periods of time. So um, I'm not sure how to answer that question. It's a good acknowledgement of what attribution modeling actually is, right? Um, as opposed to what it's not. But that's why I, I like to focus on the first purchase attribution model um, as it's the most practical to use right out of the gate because you won't get conflict if you're relying on one attribution model, you're clearly understand what's working for acquisition and what's working for retention if you rely on just one. So um, I guess I'll leave it with here. Word of warning, if you're using multiple attribution models, expect to see conflict, expect to see duplication, but also just think about your data differently, right? That's the beauty of having more than one attribution model. We have a question from Adrian, and it's, are we able to segment orders by tags? Are we able to segment order by tags? Um, I don't know. She, I would ask maybe to clarify, Adrian, the tags. Does she mean product tags or customer tags? Are we able to segment orders by tags? Are you asking, are you able to segment customers by tags? Are you able to segment products by tags? I would just need a little bit more information on segmenting out orders by tags. Oh. <clears throat> and then it looks like, um, I think that's probably good on the questions. Great. Well, I know it was a lot to digest, guys. It's a little bit technical. We're always here at Glue. We're here to help. And we know that, um, Running a business is not easy. Um, if it was easy, everybody would do it, right? So um, please let us know if you'd like to talk. Um, if you have any other questions, please send them our way. But otherwise, um, I hope this was helpful and we're excited to meet you again on the next webinar in the very near future.